Good morning again, everyone. Uh, my name is Gil Bejerano, and I come to you now from UC Santa Cruz. I, um, I'll be talking about the human genome. Maybe let's start from that. So I'll tell you uh, all kinds of things that we find very exciting, uh, new discoveries about the human genome, etc. That's what the subject of the talk will be about. And I, um, so I'm postdocing in Santa Cruz now. And as you can see, that's about ending, and I'm going to be switching over uh, in a couple months to start working as an assistant professor uh, at Stanford, uh, joined between Dev Bio and Computer Science there. And I already, if you look up close, I already have the marks of somebody who's serving two masters, so hopefully that will go away pretty soon. Anyway, um, and I did my undergrad PhD uh, in Israel, if you're wondering about the accent, so I was born and raised in Israel. And I'll just tell you about all kinds of fascinating things uh, about the human genome. You're welcome to stop me. I don't know if the format uh, allows too much of that, but I'll take questions either way and then towards the end. And the topic is, you know, these things that we find in the human genome, ultra, cons ultra conservation, living fossils, and really all kinds of new things that we're starting to understand about the genome. So, without further ado. So this, you know, the 21st century is pretty much hyped as the century of biology uh, in terms of the sciences. Uh, and I'll give you a glimpse of how we really feel about it, uh, people who work in genomics, and just how the flood of data is really changing, rewriting some basic laws of molecular biology. So from our perspective, this is definitely a fun time to be in. And you know, coming into a, a crowd that's predominantly computer science people, I assume, I can easily put this slide up and say, you know, this hour and we thing. So one of the things, that I, and my background is originally in computer science. As you've seen, I, I'm actually going to sit in the Department of, of Biology now. And you'll see why, because of, of the things that I do. But we can actually take this biological data and model it and actually cast it into terms which are mostly amenable to computational tools. OK? And we'll go through these things, strings, circuits, time series, et cetera. And there's all kinds of very exciting biology hidden, hidden out there. So uh, our story is going to start with, with DNA, the molecule of life. And, and in a second, it will be very much simplified. So if you know some biology, you know, I apologize up front. I will be smoothing things very, um, very coarse-grained. And I'll tell you exactly the amount of biology we need to kind of follow through this lecture. OK? Simplification number one. So DNA. OK, DNA is a linear molecule that is found in every living cell. And that DNA molecule actually carries the instruction of how to make a living organism. And that's what you pass on to your children, and they pass on to their children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to posterity. And for the purpose of our talk, we can cast DNA as a long string over a short alphabet. So the alphabet is only a size of four here, and the strings vary between 1,000 and you know, hundreds of, of billions of letters. And what's important for the purpose of our talk, and we'll start unwrapping this wrapper in a while, is that this long string of DNA is actually made of two components in principle. Portions or substrings that are actually never read through the lifetime of the cell. Colloquially, these are known as junk DNA. We'll go back and revisit all these terms along the lecture. So these regions are actually never used and they're there, and you'll see what happens to them, and they get copied from generation to generation. And then there are regions that are actually used. Okay, so you can think of it as remarks and the actual code if you want to oversimplify things. Okay, so that's that's the important distinction for us, and they actually tell us how, when, where, etc., to make all kinds of operations to actually have a living cell. So in each cell, which is the basic, you know, functional unit of life we're going to talk about, there is what is called a genome. And the genome effectively is a single copy of all its DNA. And the example I have here, the DNA is actually made up of two strings. So you have two strings, and the combined, they're called the genome. And every cell has a single copy of the genome. And when you, on, when you want to make two cells from one cell, you actually copy the DNA, and you get two cells. Each one has a single copy of the genome. Okay? And at the level of, of simplification that we are going to work with, a human being is 10 to the 14 cells. It starts from a single cell, and it undergoes all these rep repeated 
replications over and over. That's the point I want to stress here. Even over the lifetime of a single individual, that one string is actually replicated a huge amount of times. Okay? And you know, for this purpose, it was actually easier to talk about an egg and a chicken, chicken and egg. So you start out with a single cell, and when you get to the 1014, there we have a human being. And every one of these has a single copy of exactly the same thing. Okay? Then, of course, you have sexual reproduction. I won't have time, and it's not critical for our discussion uh, to discuss the wonders of sexual reproduction, but effectively, you have one copy from here, one copy from there, and through some uh, process that we aren't going to touch on, there is, at the end of the day, a single copy in the one cell that actually makes up the next chicken down the line. Okay? So the amount of replication of that linear molecule over a four-letter alphabet is tremendous within the lifetime of a single individual, and definitely as you start going down the generation, and we'll be cruising down hundreds of millions of years. So you can imagine how many of these replications are actually out there. And, you know, you can, make, you can take something of, a, of an ID uh, perspective on life, or you can actually look at it as a process in time during which species diverge away from each other. And if you can look at the DNA molecule in each one of these species, you can learn out fascinating things about what makes us all the same and what makes us different and how our genome has evolved over time and shaped us as we are. And that's really what we're going to talk about. And the general uh, title of this field is called comparative genomics. You compare across species. But really, this whole comparative paradigm now sweeping across biology uh, in many, many ways. So that's what we're getting to. And let me show you the power of comparative genomics through, again, through the simplification that we've just started. So imagine you have the single copy of the DNA molecule in, in this one cell. And remember, it's made out of regions that are never used, and then regions that are actually used here and there to actually make the cell. That thing, as we said, is replicated many, many times in the lifetime of that chicken, but then it's replicated in the crucial point in order to start a new chicken. Okay? And the first thing that we need to take into account here is that this replication is inherently imperfect. So all kinds of errors happen every now and then from one generation to the next. Every replication is imperfect. Some of these would be small scale. We'll talk about larger scales error later on. But these, just imagine these small scales, tiny insertions, deletions, single letters. Sometimes I'll call them bases, drop off or from one, they smear into three, or they just change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when that happens to the junk regions, the regions that are actually never read during the lifetime of an organism, anything goes. In these regions, if you can imagine, from, from organism to offspring to offspring to offspring, they just change at the rate at which this process is imperfect. Right? Letters fall off, letters join, et cetera, et cetera. But the regions that actually are functional, that actually code for something that the individual reads during its lifetime and then goes on to use, these regions actually cannot tolerate many types of changes. So maybe that one letter loss would actually be tolerated to the next generation, but perhaps that one won't, because the instruction that is now spelled out is one that won't make this either a viable one cell, or maybe the chicken that comes out won't produce as many offsprings or won't produce offspring at all. And these changes are swept out of the population through the process of selection. Okay? So effectively, this is evolution in a single slide. You have imperfect replication of the instruction set, and then you have a force that sweeps out things that are bad, takes in things that are good, and that's evolution for them. Okay? So what we are going to talk about, let, let me actually finish this. So the consequence that you can derive out of this is that Regions that actually code for something change much more slowly over time, okay? Because these all kinds of changes would be swept out of the population. So sequence conservation along the generations actually implies a function. That means that there's a sweeping force that clears out all kinds of changes that are not tolerated to actually make a viable organism and make a viable offspring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the basic observation of comparative genomics, if you like. Okay, so now we switch on. We had, you know, a single generation here. Now we're going to nonchalantly go from a single generation into 80 million years of independent evolution. 
Okay? So roughly around 80 million years ago, there lived a species, which was the common ancestor of, let's say, apes and rodents, or us and mouse, if you want to get particular. And at that time point, roughly, the two lineages separated into independently evolving lineages. So over 80 million years, there had been tremendous replication of that single string independently along this branch and independently along that branch. Okay? Now, if you have access to the linear molecule, the DNA here and there, you can actually compare the two. So you have very long strings, and when you compare them and you find the region that is actually conserved between human and mouse, you apply the same logic we talked about in a, a second ago. If this is conserved across the two organisms, then that substring must have taken all kinds of small changes that were swept out of the population. And they were swept out, presumably, because that region is functional. You have no idea what function is it, is it but you've suddenly highlighted a substring within this long, thing, long string, and you said functional. Now I have to figure out what function that is. Okay? So this is comparative uh, genomics in a nutshell. So here's, here's a quantitative look at the human genome. Okay? And that, let's call that for a second before in the pre-genomic era, which is the previous century, which is not, not longer than five to ten years ago. So the human genome is a DNA molecule of the length of three billion letters. And part of the discussion was whether we really want to see the whole thing. Okay? So quantitatively, about one and a half percent of that three billion letters has a function that we understand. That was roughly the situation before, and I'll go through what this thing actually is in a bit. And then we knew that about 50% or more of it is junk. And the question was, you know, why bother spending all these billions if at least half of them are going to be junk? And I'll show you what I hope is pretty good reason for that, or several reasons for that. So nonetheless, the whole discussion went through, and I won't go through that, and people actually went and they sequenced the whole human genome and the whole mouse genome. That was the two first mammalian genomes that were sequenced. And once you do that, you can actually see exactly what I've shown you in the previous slide. Compare the two sequences and ask how many substrings appear to be under selection, appear to be functional. And this is what this graph is showing you. It's showing you how conserved, highly conserved, or low conservation are a subset of human and mouse regions that we know to be in this junk pile. And then you compare on top of that how conserved is the entire alignment between human and mouse genome? So the same, sub, the same string evolving independently over 80 million years. And when you subtract one from the other, you see that about 5% of our genome, just by comparing to this one other species, 5% of the genome is actually highlighted as functional. And as we alluded to, that's actually three times as much as we knew before getting into this endeavor as being functional in the genome. So there's three times as much functional DNA within our genome than what we understand. And that comes up to hundreds of thousands of substrings that we can now highlight. And we have many more species now, and we can highlight them very, very clearly. And we have no clue what they do. The only reason we think they're functional is because we see them very well conserved across many, many millions of years. Question? Maybe I just don't understand it, but... Um, so presumably what you're doing is you're comparing a mouse and a human and uh -huh. you're saying, you know, where are there are a lot of changes and where they're very similar. But presumably there's also just a difference between a mouse and a human. But they start from a common ancestor. Remember, there was a single molecule that started replicating along two different branches. Original. You just have That's these two. We have and you just have these two. So right. it is possible that something that you think of as junk really represents just the difference between a mouse and a human, no? Absolutely. So this, let me put it in, in other words, this is only a lower bound on how much is actually functional in its oh. genome. Okay, let's put it that way. So there's 5% that we now understand that's by no means is the, is the final number there. Exactly because, and there will be things that are ape-specific, human-specific, and they won't even be in those comparisons, definitely. Okay? So that's a good comment. At least 5% of our genome is, is functional, but we can actually see these substrings now. We just don't we have to figure out what they do. So in 2004, you know, all these revelations came about at the end of 2002, I think uh, around Christmas or something like that. And in 2004, there was this rush of papers that I'll, I'll talk some about where we came up 
At the end of the year, there was this wrap up. Science Magazine has this breakthrough of the year every year. And in two, at the end of 2004, we came up fifth runner up. And this is what we got as a reward. So that's the reward. That shows a respectable scientist going back to the junk DNA and saying, oh my god, that piece of junk is so important, I better understand what it's doing. OK? There was a question. Yep? The genome actually originates back to the common ancestor, and how much was introduced by things like viruses and Let's do it at the end. Right? At the end. Okay, okay, I have to stay on call. So if it's a let's actually, you'll find a bit of an answer later on, and then we can take it all again at the end. Okay, stay tuned. Second half. Can you repeat the question? Okay, sure. But now I just dodged it, so I'll repeat the next one. Okay, cool. Okay, but let's, let's get back to this in the end. So, what do you do? So now I have to teach you a bit more biology. Okay, so there's two properties that we're going to talk about uh, when we look at this long string of DNA. One is that the DNA codes for proteins. Genes code for proteins. And proteins are really the workhorses of every living cell. These are the molecules that make up the cell. They make all the reaction within the cell. And your DNA tells you how to build each one of these molecules. This is actually also a linear molecule. It's just bundled up into a spaghetti ball type thing, OK? So there's this how to build a protein. And then just next to that, there's a region of roughly 1,000 letters, we assume, that tells the cell when and where to make that thing, because obviously you also want to exactly, precisely make the right quantity at the right time, not just have the ability to make it, OK? So here's a picture of the human genome. Let me walk you through this briefly. So at UC Santa Cruz, that's actually one of the two biggest portals in the world to annotation of the human genome. It's a publicly available website, and you're welcome to look at it. That's the address. Let me walk you through a snapshot, a tiny snapshot of the human genome. So up here, you should imagine 3,000 letters from the human genome. And underneath them, and now I'm skipping to the bottom, there are the 3,000 roughly matching letters from chimpanzee and from mouse and from rat and then from chicken, and they are diverging away from us, closest to furthest. So what, what's important about the graphs at the bottom is that wherever this graph peaks, that means that that letter in chimp and in human is exactly identical. And then it drops because they're not exactly identical. And then it goes back to being identical. So you see how the human and chimp DNA are almost identical across this window, much less so between human, mouse, and rat. Here's the region that's completely lost in mouse. And then with, between human and chicken, that distance is so far away that you can actually align very little. It's not that there isn't anything in chicken, but what's the sequence here in chicken is so diverged from here that we can't say with any statistical significance that they actually come from a common source. And if you go back and you map how to make a gene and when and where to turn it on, you see that the black, so this is the how and this is the when and where, and the black plot here is an average over all of these. So this says, how conserved is every letter in the human genome compared to all the other species that it's in? And that's pretty much the picture we expected to find in the human genome. So the regions that actually tell you how to build a protein are more conserved. And then in this region, this roughly 1,000 uh, letter region that tells you when and where, you know, there's a blip that goes back away and all kinds of other stuff that are there. That's pretty much the benign picture we were expecting to find. What we actually found was very different from that when we went in. So I'll show you. I won't be able to jump to the logic of how we got there, but I'll just jump to one very surprising discovery that we had uh, at that year, two years ago. So, you know, it's the same plot that I've showed you before. Now I'm showing you actually many more species, all the way out to fish, which are the furthest uh, vertebrates from us that have been sequenced today, ray-finned fish. And what you see here is that this region here is in no gene. It's actually not even close to any gene. And if you see this plateau of extreme conservation just in the middle of nowhere in our genome, because we started marching through all these genomes. And if you look at individual species, you see that these are hundreds of letters or bases that actually haven't changed all the way between us and chicken. There's a region here of about 300 letters that haven't changed a bit between us and chicken and has changed some, but it's very well conserved all the way out to fish. Okay? So let me explain to you why, when you see 300 letters that are perfectly conserved across 300 million years of evolution, why you should be scratching, I guess, your forehead. So this is just a zoom in. Let me skip that. So 
you know, why is that so surprising? Why is it that these regions that are perfectly conserved across these species over fair million is so surprising? So, as I alluded to before, that means that there was a sequence, let's say, of 300 letters, subsequence here in the common ancestor, and along all these independent lineages, it has taken on all kinds of small mutations. Bases dropped, bases came, bases changed, and all of those were swept away to keep exactly the same 300 letters in each one of these species. And now we have on the order of a dozen of these, close to 20 almost, actually. Okay? So you add that to the following fact, and this becomes really surprising. There's nothing in our genome that we understand as encoded in it that is encoded in a non-redundant fashion. Everything that we understand is encoded in the human genome. Every unit of information that we understand is encoded in a redundant fashion. Okay, let me give you an example. We wanted to make a protein out of the DNA sequence. We wanted to explain how to make that protein. So we have a long string over an alphabet of four, and now we want to make a string of roughly, let's say, 100 letters over an, another alphabet of 20. So how do you code a word over an alphabet of 20 if you have an alphabet of four? The solution that was chosen, you know, in our genomes, for example, is the following. Just take contiguous three letters, and every three letters give you 64 combinations. That's more than plenty to code 20 letters. So you change from three of these to one of those every single time. And you've now mapped yourself between 64 and 21. There's a, a 21st one that actually says stop. That, that string is, is now ready. Okay, so look at that. So you can pick anything you want for the... You, you, this table actually tells you how to convert from the four letter to the 20 letter. Let, let's look at an example here of these blocks here. So pick C as your first letter in this, three, in this code on alphabet, another C here, and it doesn't matter what you pick as your third letter, you always get the same letter in that position in the, in the protein. Now that tells you that if anything happens to that third letter here, along any of these lineages, there's no way selection would prune that out. There's no way for selection to sweep that out because you get exactly the same protein sequence. That's the type of redundancy I'm talking about, and that's why when you see these perfectly conserved regions, we don't understand what type of encoding requires that. Question? Yes. Um, my question is, you, did you say that this highly conserved region is not a part of any gene? I didn't say that. Either. Okay. So, stay tuned. <coughs> the question. Okay. Um, so, all I said is that, well, that one actually I did say wasn't a part of any gene. You're right. This one isn't. I'll show you what the ensemble looks like. But so the when you, is, how do you know that oh, it's not we, a part we of any gene? Okay. 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 So, for well, now, the observation is hundreds of bases, hundreds of letters, perfectly conserved across hundreds of millions of, of years, just doesn't jive with anything we understand as encoding in our genome because of this redundancy. And where there is redundancy, selection cannot act, you would think. Okay? So, in order to go and, and show you the set of all these things, I have to take you through another forest. So we said, this is how to make a protein, and this is when and where to turn it on. That picture is actually true for simpler organisms, uh, predominantly unicellular organisms, but we said we are made out of 10 to 14 uh, cell types. And what we understand now in vertebrates in particular is that that region that actually tells us when and where to turn each one of these on actually extends through three orders of magnitude more sequence. That way, that way. So in about two million letters, there are all kinds of regions out there that actually tells you very precisely when and where to turn that gene on. And they do it, by the way, because some of these proteins actually go back and they bind the DNA. So they go back and they bind that molecule. Some of them help it turn this gene on. Some of them stop this gene from being turned on. There's all this regulation there of these things coming on and falling off. So that's, that's another kind of a revolution that has undergone, let's say, in the last 10 to 20 years in molecular biology, and understanding how predominant these regions are. So, and I just said that. So, you know, and, and when you have whole genome, you can actually see that there are many thousands of these. I'll give you a taste of that uh, towards the end. And really, most of them have been previously invisible, because the only way currently, without understanding how these are encoded, to see that there's a region there that controls this gene is just to see, and it's highly conserved in this other species, and this other species, and this other species. So all these things that we've thought of as junk actually now become these control boxes. Okay? 
So let me, let me walk you through these regions and I'll get back to the question then. So you can actually set up, once you realize that these things are out there in your three billion base uh, string, you can actually set up a query that a priori would have been a semi-ridiculous one, but only semi-ridiculous. So you can ask for all, you know, at the time we did this, effectively we had three genomes in our hand, human, mouse, and rat. That, those were the three genomes. And we asked for all the regions of a substring of 200 consecutive letters or more that are perfectly conserved across these three species. So you do the, the, the pretty basic, like back of an envelope math, and you see that if you take three billion letters and you evolve them independently along the human lineage and then along the road and splitting into mouse and rat, there shouldn't be a single one, a single sequence of 200 letters that is perfectly conserved across the three, even in three billion letters. And, and what we actually find is 500 of these, almost 500, and that's what we dubbed ultra-conserved elements. So let me tell you about them a bit. So A, these regions actually are not frozen. So they're perfectly conserved across between us and, and let's say chicken actually, and then somebody in this room could have a single letter that's changed from everybody else. They're not quite frozen, but they do evolve 24 slower than the rest of our genome. Most of these do not explain how to build proteins. So we've gotten very good these days at actually understanding the syntax of how to build proteins. And we know that these do not code for that. They have stop codons all over the place, some of them, et cetera, et cetera. So they say, stop doing that, stop doing that. That's not the way to build a protein sequence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't want to go into more details, but the, the, about three quarters of these do not code for proteins. That was one of the fun surprises. Um, the ones that do not, actually, they're just not just peppered around the genome, but we repeatedly find them just controlling effectively genes that encode DNA binding proteins. Remember, those are the proteins that go back to, control, to bind the DNA and control whether other genes get turned on and off. So they are part of the regulation machinery that turns things on and off. And we can do these experiments, I'll talk to you about them in a second, where you can take one of these regions and show that in this mouse embryo of day 11.5, that one particular region, that ultra-conserved element, makes sure that it is only expressed in the eye at that particular developmental stage. And at other developmental stages, it would confer a very different pattern of expression. Okay, we'll get to that in a bit. Now, the ones that do tell you how to code for proteins also focus on a specific subset of proteins that do a specific function. Again, implying that there's something functionally important about these regions that have to be perfectly conserved rather than some fluke accident or regions that are just copied better for whatever reason than others. Okay, and on this graph I've shown you before, they really are the tip of a continuum whose heavy tail we don't really understand of highly conserved elements, that we have to understand what are the function, the forces that, that control them. And then let me show you that actually in the next slide. So these ultra-conserved elements, we've defined them between three mammals. This is the tree of life. And they're found all across vertebrates, all the way out to these ray fin fish. But then when you cross this boundary between vertebrates and invertebrates, all these regions are gone. So it's a surprising phenomenon in the sense that almost all of them are found within this subtree. You go one step beyond and the whole thing goes away. So the question is, where did these regions come from? That's one of the questions. Not only what do they do and what actually maintains them perfectly, but where did they come from? And I'll walk you through one story where you could understand where they come from and that source is actually, was pretty surprising to us and you'll see how this fascinating fish that kind of sits here between these two branches was able to tell us that story. Okay, so we move on to that question. So the question is, where did these regions come from? If they just disappear out here, where do they come from? Is it they're there and we can't see them? Or did they actually just land somewhere over here and start evolving from there? So here's, here's one of them. We had 481 of them. Here's ultra-conserved element. 338, that's the one, you can see the same plot of conservation I've showed you before. Here's the plateau here of perfect conservation across multiple species, that's our guy. And what you see down here are matches from elsewhere in the human genome. And they're coded by chromosome, I didn't define chromosome, but effectively everywhere in the genome there are all kinds of matches only to that particular region. Okay, in all kinds of places within our genome. We were very curious about that, there's a graph here that's missing, so some of these matches actually, so these are all regions 
that come from a common source. That's what this thing is telling us. Somewhere there was a common origin to all these regions. Some of them actually explain how to build proteins, but they explain how to build only a small portion of very different proteins. You look at the proteins whose structure, whose gene structure they make, and there's nothing in common between them. So we wanted to understand what this whole family of things with an ultra-conserved representative came into being in the human genome. Okay? So I'll just walk you now through the clues that actually made us understand what this family is, unraveled the history of this family. So the first surprise we had, remember I was showing you here how this region is so similar to all kinds of other regions in the human genome? So you, ask, you go to the public databases, and the public databases now are filling up at a very pleasing uh, rate, and there are DNA sequences from all kinds of critters out there. And you can go to that repository and just ask, what is my sequence most similar to? And this is just a sorted list by species name of what this ultra-conserved element is most similar to. And surprisingly, at the very top there, you see six regions from a species called Latimeria menadoensis, which are closest to the ultra-conserved element than all these family members within the human genome itself. So you look up this species, and that species is silicon. Silicon is a fascinating lobe fish. I'll show you that in the context of a tree of life. But effectively, it has four limbs like us. It just did something different to them. So silicons, let's look at it at the tree of life. Here's where invertebrates end. You come into vertebrates. That's ray fin fish, and that's amphibians, tetrapods, all the vertebrates that have gone on to occupy the land. And there's two fascinating branches here one into lungfish and one into silicon that have actually, you know, they have their own set of hind and forelimbs. So there's a, fascinating, there's a nice sociological story, if you like, behind that species. It was, it was thought to be missing for 100 million years because we could only find it in the fossil records. And then in 1938, you know, a, a, a fishing trawler went off the coast of South Africa and effectively came with a live dinosaur in the net. So that was a big surprise. But the, the fascinating thing is that the specimens, now we have you know, dozens of specimens of that species. The specimens that we find today are almost identical morphologically to what the fossils that have left behind about 100 million years ago. And that what dubs a species into being called a living fossil. So the, the phenotype, the actual morphology of the species hasn't changed over 100 million years. We don't know what that implies about the genome and how that encodes it, but the morphology hasn't changed over 100 million years. So we had multiple hits of our ultra-conserved element in human to that thing. And in order to explain to you why, what, what, what the story there is, I have to tell you another bit of, of how our genome actually works. Okay, and that actually goes back to a question that I dodged before. So here's your genome. Now I chopped it up into, I guess, eight strings. And within many, many genomes, there are actually regions that are called repeats, or mobile elements, or selfish DNA. There are substrings that have learned to duplicate themselves within our genome. That's all they do. They actually know how to hop out of the genome, hop back into a new place. Okay, they copy themselves at a random new location. Pretty much, pretty soon, you actually have tons and tons of these. And actually, when I was saying before that, more than half of our genome is junk, it's exactly those regions that just faded away now. So they learn how to du duplicate themselves around the genome, but actually, apart from doing that for their own sake, the cell never uses them. So they're part of the junk. And when something is a part of the junk and you start replicating it from one generation to the next generation, it fades away, exactly what I've shown you here, because there's no reason to preserve it in any state. So they multiply, then they stop jumping around, and they decay away. That's a known phenomena within many genomes, including half of our own, at least half of our own. So what did we have? Let me show you again on the tree of life, and we can search all these species because we had genome for them. What did we have with respect to that ultra-conserved element? We had, actually, there's like a tiny bit of that, of the genome of silicon. The, the genome of silicon is roughly on the order of ours, on the order of a billion bases. We had a mega base. We had a million letters of that genome. That's less than a thousand. Okay, we had a million out of a billion, and in that million we had 60 instances, 60 substrings, very similar to our ultra-conserved elements, and they were very similar to each other, suggesting that what we see in silicons is actually one of those repeats that is hopping around. That's the only reason to see 60 of these in a million letters, okay? Now, 
Lungfish, there's even less DNA. We don't know what happened there. But in all these species, all the tetrapods, what we had is a very different picture. So we have whole genome here, all whole genomes here, on the order of a gigabase of a, of a billion letters. And in each one of these, we had 100 copies very dissimilar to each other, but similar enough for statistical significance, 100 copies per a billion letters, okay? 100 very dissimilar in a billion letters versus 60 in, a, in million letters very similar. And the most parsimonious, the explanation that requires, you know, the least hand waving is the one that you had a repeat, the one I've shown you before, you had a repeat that was born over here before these three lineages split off, and that repeat is active to this day in silicon, and then it died either once or multiple times along this lineage, okay? So it started out here jumping around the genome, and it's jumping to this day or until very recently in silicon genome, and then it died away in all these other genomes. So if it died away in all these other genomes, what are these 100 copies that we actually still see there, right? I just said that, you know, that thing confers no function to the, the cell, and it just gets swept away during evolution. So let's go back and revisit that that picture, so there's a phenomenon known as co-option. Now remember I told you a substring learns how to jump out and then suddenly there's many, many copies of it. Now what happens, and this can actually be in the hundreds of thousands in our own genome. There are actually things creeping and crawling there in the hundreds of thousands. And what happens, and I'm going to have to uh, apologize for my con world of, uh, inner world I guess, I'll show you that in a second, is that if you have enough of these, if you have 100,000 Every now and then, maybe every once in a blue moon, what happens is one of these copies lands in a genomic context, that's what I'm trying to say, that lends it a new meaning. Okay? <laughs> so you have a genomic context that lends you a new meaning. What this, hap what this means in a molecular sense is that suddenly that thing clicks into action. Suddenly the cell can take hold of it and use it for something functional. So one of your comments just jumped into a new place and suddenly became a functional uh, command. And this is what we rationalize happened in the tetrapod genomes. And that's why all these other copies, the unlucky, you know, the unlucky masses faded away. And that's why in tetrapods we only see these hundred lucky copies that actually took on a function. That was the rationale. Okay? So in order to make that stick, say that that's the hundred that took on a cop uh, function, and in silicon, it's just still jumping. That's why we see so many of them. We had to actually attach a function to these guys. Okay? So that was the last nail we needed in that respect. And in order to do that, I'll skip the technical details, but we convinced ourselves that actually quite a few of these, remember in humans there's about 200 of these, quite a few of these actually are involved in gene regulation. That's what they do. They're part of the red boxes. They turn genes off and they turn gene on, okay? So if you want to rationalize that, if you say, here's a gene out there, that's the green box and that's the red box, I'm, I apologize for the color, but if you want to say that that region you think controls when and where that gene can turn on, here's one way you can test that, and we've done that uh, in collaboration with Eddie Rubin's lab at Lawrence Berkeley, um, not too far from here. You can actually copy that small region, think of 500 letters, copy it out of the genome, and put it in front of a reporter gene, never mind that, that thing in, in the middle there, that's a gene that when it gets turned on, you can actually color it in blue. So you can take an embryo and ask yourself, where does that thing turn on in my genome? So you build that construct of a, of a couple thousand letters, and you inject it back into one cell embryos. And that thing hops into the genome at that stage, and then it goes through the embryo, and you can stop the embryo wherever you like and ask, where is that gene that was never in that genome before, where is that thing turned on? And that thing is turned on only as a result of this thing either driving it or not driving it. So you can do that on one side, and then on the other side, you can ask, just take a, a plain wild-type embryo and ask, where is that gene actually turned on at the, at the exact same developmental stage? So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take one of the regions that came from a repeat, from a selfish piece of DNA, and, make, and ask where does that drive expression of, of a reporter gene compare that to the wild type gene, okay? Let me show you. So these are quite expensive experiments. They take uh, over two months. Let me show you the one representative that I'm going to talk about today. So here's one of the strings of DNA, and this is about a million letters of your genome, 
Okay, and we picked that tick mark over here. In that one million letters, there's a single gene, a single green box that tells you how to build a protein. And presumably, all these expanses of, of space next to it is where all the red boxes are lodged. And you can actually see that visually. So there are three other red boxes that have been verified before ours. These, you know, nobody knows about the revolutionary origins, but there are three other red boxes next to that gene. But when you compare this whole one million, million letters, let's say to frog, nothing that evolved neutrally should align between us and frog. The only regions you see aligning between us and frog presumably are there because they're functional and selection sweeps away all the sequences that diverge from a common core. All these tick marks here presumably act to make sure that this gene gets turned on at the right time and the right place, and we understand barely three of them. One of them, by the way, is another ultra-conserved element. I won't talk about that one. So we had this guy over here. One of the things that go back to folks so shared across all tetrapods coming from a repetitive sequence, and we said that guy controls that gene. So we went and done exactly the experiment I told you, taking that thing out of context, put it in front of a new gene, a reporter gene, and ask where is that thing expressed. And what you see on the left is how our several hundred letter region drive expression, drive expression of the reporter gene compared to the wild type islet one gene that sits there in the middle of that picture. And you can see that the patterns are very well matching you can actually zoom in and see this, these are genital eminence here. You can see the outer ridge of the developing limb. Very clear matching patterns. You can actually go ahead and section through the head, uh, the brain, the thorax, etc. And you can see that the sections also match very nicely between where our small region drive expression of a reporter gene versus the wild type gene is being expressed. So you can tell yourself, what we've done here is we've proven that one of these red control boxes, this one is actually very far away, it's 500,000 bases uh, letters from the gene it regulates, can actually come from these repetitive sources. That's, that's part of the big news that came out of that work. So let, let me kind of spend the last few minutes, I guess, explaining why that last observation, that these control boxes can actually come from these things that hop around in our genome, why that is so much fun. So remember I told you DNA replication is imperfect, right? And we focused before on how things happen at small scale. One letter falls off, another one adds. What actually happens is that these changes happen on all scales. And sometimes, quite often, you get whole substrings replicated twice in the next generation. Sometimes whole substrings fall off. But let's focus on the ones that actually get replicated. So if you can imagine this being a gene, this tells you how to make a protein, suddenly in the next generation you can have two copies of this thing. Okay, now, if you have two copies of this thing, this guy typically was already doing, let's imagine, 10 different shows in your, in your cell. So when it got actually made into a protein, that protein was busy doing all kinds of things. Now you can make it from two different templates. You can actually imagine this guy taking on five of the function, the other guy taking on the other five, and then each of them can actually accommodate new functions by changing the sequence. And it's just that the common, you know, the subset of both of them actually does all that that guy was doing before and a bunch more. Okay? So what we were thinking before the genomic era is through these type of duplications, you just make more genes and you have a more complex organism. That was part of the thinking. So we were supposed to have many more genes than simpler organisms. And that came out as a resonant, resonant no. Okay, so here's a, bar, here's a bar chart, I guess, of how many genes per all these sequence individuals, sequence organisms. And you can see that we, we, before this thing started, it was thought that human had 100,000 genes. And that thing kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And now we're quite, it, it shrinks to this day, by the way. And we're actually quite in par with this worm, C. elegans, that has 1,000 cells to the adult. 1,000 cells versus 10 to the 14, hundreds of different tissue types in human, et cetera, et cetera, the same repertoire of genes. Okay, that was one of the big messages that came out of these, these uh, genome projects. And really what we understand today is that it's not the genes that actually matter to a large extent. You know, everything matters in biology, but it seems that the biggest footprint is actually in, in diversity is that of the control boxes. So actually adding on new control boxes and taking them away has a profound effect 
on how an organism looks. And what I'm showing you here is two examples, one out of Sean Carroll's lab in New Madison, another one from Stanford, uh, David Kingsley. And you can see how you add a single control box in front of a single gene, and you get a new spot on a fly wing. And that happens because this gene now gets turned on at a very specific time, at a very specific place. Remember, these are typically genes that then go on and bind DNA elsewhere, and they turn on other genes that turn on other genes that turn on other genes. You get like a scaling effect. Same deal here. You take one of these out, and you have a threefold, at least, reduction in these, hind, in these, hind, uh, in these pelvic bones here. So very, very uh, marked phenotype. So, Regulatory regions actually, we think now, are the major driving forces of, of uh, phenotypic diversity in vertebrates. And, and really, you can compare vertebrates to invertebrates, and you can find the same genes doing pretty much the same thing, but you can never match the control boxes between vertebrates and invertebrates. We think that some of that is because it's been so long ago that we actually need to know better how to compare them, but definitely some of these things are vertebrate-specific. And they're more, you know, I just showed you one that was tetrapod specific. So some of these control boxes can land out of clear, out of thin air, click into action, and give you a very clear phenotype. That's part of what we were showing you. Okay. And let's just skip that. It's, you know, the, the, the puzzle is even greater because for, in this particular example, that's actually one of the most, I think, fun things when you're working in genomics these days. You you write up your work and you answer maybe one question or two questions, but immediately you raise many more questions than you've actually answered. So in this particular case, here is the repeat. Here is the selfish bit of DNA in that fish, okay? You change it very little, and that thing actually codes for protein. This is the ultra-conserved element I've shown you before. That one actually codes for protein. You change it very little in a different way, and that thing is the one I showed you controlling the mouse embryo. We haven't a clue of how you can make something meaningful here that will last hundreds of million years, something meaningful there, and what exactly they come from. What is that junk really? We're working on that. Um, so, you know, pretty much this is really the shape of the human genome today. I, I love this caricature, actually. Nabbed it to my website. And this is interpretation, right? We've assembled the thing. So it's, it's already assembled. But as far as things go, let me give you one last example, maybe. Maybe I won't give you an example. There's all kinds of things that are mysterious. Maybe I'll just say that in a second. This is the whole genome, 3 billion bases, and that's what needed to Xerox out of the genome in order to make protein coding genes. Another technology that just came into being allows us to measure, allows us to measure how much is actually copied out of the genome. That's the number. So, we don't know what the vast majority of these things that are Xeroxed out of the genome do. So it's not that just that our end of the field is, is in flux. The whole thing is perfect in flux. So let me wrap up by just telling you, um, so I've told you about three works, I think, predominantly that I've done through the postdoc, and now I'm starting up my own lab. And really the focus of that lab would be in understanding what these regions do. There's thousands and thousands of these. They're clearly huddled around developmental genes. These are the genes that have to control this beautiful temporal you know, uh, trajectory and multiple trajectories within it. So you would think that there is no need for all these control boxes. You can definitely see in the genome what you see in the embryo. So these are embryos going from fish to human. You can see how they're very similar when they start out, and then they diverge away and further diverge away. You can see the same thing in the genome. Our genome shares all kinds of red boxes with fish genomes. Those actually, those presumably pattern this phase. And then as you go further and further out, there are boxes that are similar to less and less species. That's what in common with these guys, and then, then et cetera, et cetera, until you get to human-specific uh, sequences. So it's a fun field to work with. There's all kinds of things to do. We actually want to understand this code. It's a regulatory, we call it the regulatory code, and effectively we need to break it. We need to understand how all these boxes control when and where the genes are turned on. We want to understand how they evolved. I show you that some of them can actually land out of thin air. Um, and finally, uh, last but definitely not least, there's actually, you know, a lot of focus has been taken over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years in understanding the genes themselves, how to make a protein. And when that goes bad from a replication between one um, organism and another, and some genes, are, some proteins are not done the right way, you get all kinds of disease. 
but there are all kinds of diseases that we can either not explain through the genome, that we know are hereditary, or we can explain portions of which. And this is just one striking case where a single letter change in one of these control boxes actually matches perfectly in families where they have this phenotype of polydactyly, that's extra fingers um, to the hand. You see there's at least six of them, I think, in each one of these. So just understanding the regulatory code has a lot of potential going from bench, wet and dry bench to the bedside, okay? And finally, from a computational perspective, there are all these fascinating challenges of these large databases, very challenging data, um, et cetera, et cetera, and tools, and really thousands of users out there that you can serve as well as serve your own interest in, in pursuing science. Okay, to wrap things up, there really is a lot of flux these days about understanding genomics, and it all came about because we threw those sequences on the table. We now have whole genomes to look at, not just looking under the lamp at the regions we thought were important. Now we see all kinds of other things. And technology is really the driving force these days. There are all kinds of technologies that allow you to measure all kinds of things genome-wide, and they revolutionize, revolutionize what we understand or we expect to find in our genome. Um, I've talked about a couple of things, these extremely conserved regions, these ultra-conserved regions, which were pre pretty much in the dark still about what exactly they do. We think it has to do with DNA structure. There are reasons for that. I won't go into them now, but uh, presumably there's a very specific structure that they have to take in space, and that accounts for 100% conservation, we think. Uh, we want to understand evolution of morphology through these boxes and definitely uh, contribute to, to treating human disease. And finally, there's all kinds of things. That's the copying out, all kinds of things about our genome that are in flux. Okay, so let me wrap up by thanking people and kind of encouraging, well, at least myself, or hopefully everybody. Um, first and foremost, David Hausler, who's my mentor at UC Santa Cruz. It's been a, just a brilliant trip, and other people in Santa Cruz and elsewhere that I've worked with uh, through the postdoc. And you for your patience. Thank you. Yep. You talk about timing, uh, about uh, some of the regulatory uh, issues. Of, uh, are you talking in terms of cell generation, or what is what is the time uh, base that you're talking about? Is so, that, is that actual temporal time? Oops. Uh, let me get back. Let me see if I can get back. So, you know, you have a process there where a single cell becomes two, and the two becomes four, et cetera, et cetera, actually. And that is the process that I talk about. So individual cells have to make the right type of proteins for themselves, and then they have to interact with other cells. That's what I want. So there's this whole trajectory out there that happens at all levels. This is a single cell that has to make the right proteins in order to become two cells. And then these two have to make sure that they are in sync with each other and they also produce the, the same building blocks, the same well, working molecules in order to go to the fourth stage cell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I mean by temporality. I mean, within, so you can imagine each cell as an autonomous unit. It has to do the right things and in order to do the right things at the right time, it has to produce the right molecules to do them. That's where the genome kicks in. The genome is the template of how to make the things and when and where to make them. But the when is the generation number in that divisions uh, sequence? The when, I, that has a key more to play, but if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, the when is actually other protein molecules binding next to that gene and turning that one on. That's what, I won't bother you with that, but that's what all the circuitry was about. It's about one going on, one gate, let's call it, one going on and turning on the next one, turning on the next one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that has to do both in what happens within a single cell and both in what happens in its context. All these signals have to be assimilated at the right time. And somehow they're assimilated predominantly to those bindings of proteins, other processes as well, right? I've smoothed out a lot of biology here. But these are key players there, turning things on at the right time to have the right molecule in the right quantity or the right tissue, et cetera, et cetera. Yep? That we could learn sort of faster about the control boxes by you know, like looking at models in simpler organisms. 
like viruses and bacteria, which have you know, like a much shorter evolutionary right. sort of. Like, yeah. yeah. So the question was, can we learn anything from simple organisms about these higher level ones? So the simple question, the simple answer is absolutely. The problem is that the models break down because it seems that at our current understanding that already vertebrates and, inver and invertebrates are very complex in their own ways. But it seems that there's things that the vertebrate subtree of the tree of life does that others do not. And that's these boxes that lie up to a million letters away. That seems to be vertebrate specific. If you believe that, you're kind of stuck with vertebrates to understand those. You can understand the regions that are close by to the genes, but not the ones that are further out there. And when you want to understand them, you're pretty much in vertebrate land. One of the things that I glossed through is actually we're hoping to come up with distant metrics to maybe map some of these back to invertebrates. I mean, to some extent, it doesn't make sense that we make the same organs, let's say, or similar organs from the same sets of genes, and we share none of the control boxes. It makes much more sense that some of the control boxes are shared, but the sequences have diverged so far that if you have no idea what they encode for, and we don't at the moment, you have to rely on statistical similarity, you know, uh, edit distance, essentially, and that goes away at some point, and you can still keep the function. So it's a mixed bag. Pretty much we're stuck in vertebrate land for the regions that are far out there, we think, at the moment. Yep. So if I can repeat my question, if there is a, in your studies, have you found any parts of the genome which were introduced and did not come from a, introduced from external sources and did not come from a common ancestor, things like viral okay. infections or? So, so the question, I'll cast it in the terms that are, are common in this field. The question is whether we can see something which is called horizontal gene transfer. I forget if it's, I think it's horizontal. So the question is, can you actually see pieces of DNA that didn't come from some common ancestor? What I've shown you here are pieces from the common ancestor that they just hop around. The question was, can you have something come out of an external source? So in the human genome, for example, you have a viral infection. That viral infection actually goes to the cells that actually make up your progeny, it affects their genome, and suddenly the genome that goes on to the next generation has been, there's a chunk of DNA that was never from the common answer, you know, from the parent of that child that goes on beyond that. In the human genome, when it was first sequenced, it was thought that we were seeing several of these cases. All of them pretty much have been dispelled. That doesn't mean that there aren't any, but there aren't any known. We know in other vertebrates, in some types of fish, of clear cases like that. So you can show which species of bacteria actually donated a chunk of DNA to that, I believe, salmon subspecies. So it does happen even in these higher, uh, more complex, let's say, organisms. There isn't a single verified case in human. But I didn't say there aren't any. I'm curious uh, how much in these databases we kind of tend to ignore the 3D information in these sequences of bases. So like, for instance, for your control blocks, if they're a million bases apart, do they actually have any spatial locality? Or do they, uh, do so, they do? So the question was, what about the spatial structure that presumably we ignore? So there are a lot of things that we sweep under the rug here, definitely in treating them as sequences. One of them is really this spatial conformation. I don't think I have, I don't have a slide here, but what, there are two predominant ways of thinking how something that's a million letters away can affect something that happens here. One of them is that thing falls in 3D space and comes close. So it's far away in sequence space, but when you actually see the thing packed, it's actually very close. Another way of, of looking at it, another way of hypothesizing is that things bind over there, other proteins bind over there, and then they slide along that, that length. of the, And there are evidence going here and there. Knowing biology, there might actually be cases that, that work this and that way. But definitely structure is a key player here that we haven't addressed directly. Part of what you assume is that it's encoded in the sequence. And therefore, those regularities that make up the structural features could already possibly be there and be modeled if you apply the right statistical tools, even if you don't understand it. But it's definitely a key player. And I, did, I, I, I wish I had a slide for that. That long molecule, the DNA, it's not just floating there in the cell. It's actually wrapped up in yo-yo structures. And the yo-yo structures are themselves, they come in packets. And the packets come in bigger packets. So there's the whole structural aspect of the thing. And the yo-yos can be wrapped to this side and that side. And suddenly something is accessible and something isn't. I've smoothed a lot of stuff that has to do with structure, definitely.
Okay? Yep. When you uh, take a control uh, structure uh, and put an indicator on it, uh, 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 so the reporting gene, yeah. the reporting gene uh, how do you know that it's controlling the reporting gene? I mean, you're taking it out of context somewhere else and putting it somewhere else. You just right. put it at the same distance, or you... No, uh, so one of the magic... So, let me start by the end, because the end would be more clear, and then I'll confuse you when I get back. So the question is, how do you know that this control element that you've taken out of context actually controls the reporter gene? So the methodology there has been worked out. What you do is you take the reporter gene, your indicator, and then you integrate it into the genome without that box, and you see that it's never on. That's one of the things you do. And then you add that thing. The only thing you've changed in your experiment is you've added that box you ask exactly the same question, what happens at, 11 point, at day 11.5, and suddenly you, th you see it turned on. And, and another thing that, that, that is very important is that you never only see it in one embryo. You actually need to have your result replicable across multiple individuals, unfortunately, in some, case, in, 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 in some respects. But you definitely replicate your result across multiple embryos. So you say, without this piece of DNA, there's nothing there, I add it on, and there's a clear pattern that I see across 10 embryos, exact same pattern, or near exact same pattern. And the only rationale is that piece of DNA that you added is the one that confers that change, because that's the only thing that changed in that, that experience. Now, having said that, these magic boxes that work up to a million bases away, you place them 100 bases away of the indicator, and they still work. You place them in this orientation, you place them in that orientation, they work. So. There are all kinds of things, and I, I still haven't told you how exactly they integrate into the genome. That would puzzle you even more, but let's say that they, that's, that has its quirk as well. But as far as we can see, it, it confers very precise control, and that control just matches very nicely, typically as a subset of the patterns of the gene from whose neighborhood you took it away, which also tells you that you actually did grab a part of the repertoire.